We are grateful that you are joining us today's Fighting Hate From Home webinar, vital to the fight against anti-Semitism and racism, centering Jews of color. For today's call, ADL CEO and National Director, Jonathan Greenblatt, will be in conversation with Marcella White Campbell, Executive Director of the Cholashon, an organization dedicated to strengthening Jewish identity by raising awareness about the ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity of Jewish people and experience around the globe. A little bit about our guest before we dive in. Marcella White Campbell is the Executive Director of Bechol Lashon. Prior to this role, she served as the Director of Marketing and Communications for the organization. Before joining Bechol Lashon, Marcella was a branding and storytelling consultant, guiding clients towards developing clear, innovative, and culturally sensitive content and media. Her writing has been published in numerous outlets, including The Forward, Kveller, Huffington Post, and Jewish Anne, the whole of online publication that amplifies the voices of ethnically and racially diverse Jews. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn the call over to Jonathan. Thank you so much, Allison. I appreciate it. Thanks to everyone for joining today. I'm glad to have the opportunity to host this webinar, which I'm really excited about because I'm incredibly excited about Marcel and her leadership. But before we dive into that, let me just step back. You know, as we celebrate Black History Month, I think it's important to acknowledge and reflect on the great diversity within our Jewish community, as well as across the country, but particularly to celebrate our brothers and sisters in, in Black and in Jewish Black communities. And I think it's important to do this, not just because this is Black History Month, we need to do this every month, and we need to be engaged in a more open conversation about the multiracial and dynamic nature of our community itself. But Black History Month does afford us an opportunity uh, in as much as it allows us to celebrate Black leaders and inventors and artists and movements and so much more. But it also creates, I think, a it helps to structure a dialogue and, a, and uh, some degree of introspection about ourselves and to focus on the triumphs and struggles against Black oppression, against discrimination and racial injustice that unfortunately have been a part of Black history in America since before our country's inception. Black leaders, especially Black Jewish leaders, have been at the forefront of fighting both racism and anti-Semitism for centuries. Today, we look forward to highlighting these vital efforts and diving into discussion about what it means to be, you know, what it means for, our, for the Jewish community to move forward on its commitment to racial justice in this 21st century. And, you know, why do we have to have such a commitment to racial justice. Well, to be clear, we live in a world in a country of contradictions and our government may have been founded on a, on a revolutionary vision of equality, but I think it, it, we're still rooted in a fundamentally unequal society. And we need to deal with the painful reality that throughout American history, up to the present day, black people have been treated as less than everywhere they turn and have been systematically uh, denied opportunities and marginalized in different corners of society. ADL recognizes, and ADL was founded on the premise that injustice for one is injustice for all, and that the black community in the United States, including black Jews, have suffered and continue to struggle under the heavy binding weight of injustice, which again, unfortunately, has been a per persistent part of their existence. We understand that every person must play an active part in lifting some of that weight if we're also going to eventually shrug off the legacy of racism. And the Jewish people, of all races and ethnicities in this country, I would say the Jewish people should be entirely and uh, fulsomely committed to this, to this endeavor. Our intersecting black and Jewish communities have a long and storied history of standing up for one another, marching arm in arm, praying with our feet against oppressive forces. As, as I think many of you know, American Jews, including white Jews, have a long history of supporting and contributing to black led movements for equity. Many of our Jewish ancestors saw echoes of their own personal experiences of anti, of anti Semitic injustice or systemic vilification or discriminatory treatment in what was happening to Black Americans. And I think our non Jewish Black friends and neighbors also have repeatedly risen to the defense of the Jewish community, particularly as World War II and the Holocaust unfurled and proved the terrifying power of anti Semitism at a state scale. And now also, as we face threats today from white nationalists, or white supremacists and our very country 
it's not lost on me that when we've dealt with tragedy at synagogues or, or kosher supermarkets, et cetera, some of the first calls that I received have been from my friends and peers in black led organizations. And again, I think as we think about these worlds, it's Jews of color who straddle multiple forces of marginalization and are forced to endure both racism and anti-Semitism. They need to be central to our strategies of fighting these age-old hatreds. Last summer, it was, it was personally important to me and I think critical for ADL to show up and stand up for those who are peacefully demonstrating for social justice after the murder of George Floyd and the killing of Breonna Taylor literally evoked this national movement to finally try to come to terms with this, this painful legacy of injustice that's persisted for far too long. And last summer, I, uh, you know, ADL played a pivotal role in creating a Stop Here for Profit coalition and had the chance to work arm in arm with the NAACP and Color of Change, as well as with other BIPOC-led organizations like LULAC and the National Hispanic Media Center uh, in an effort to push Facebook to do better because we recognize that you know, social media augments all kinds of intolerance and the racism and xenophobia and anti-Semitism on that platform threatens all of us. I'm also wanna make sure that I share, you know, toward the end of last year, uh, as and growing today as we speak, the ADL launched a partnership with the National Urban League called My Vote, My Time, which focused on, in several pilot cities, bringing young American Jews and young black Americans together around pushing for you know, to protect the vote and register people to show up at the polls. And that kind of engagement around civic participation, again, I think it benefits not all of our, just our communities, but the country as a whole. So this question about how do we center black Jews? How do we center Jews of color? How do we center you know, marginalized communities in the conversation as we attempt to struggle with issues of justice and fair treatment? I think the time has never been more important. And so I'm really delighted to host this conversation today with Marcella White Campbell, who is the new executive director of Bahá'u Lashon, to talk with her about the urgent need to confront America's entrenched racism and persistent anti-Semitism, and how these intersections between the African-American and the American Jewish community can strengthen the fight against hate that's plagued both communities for centuries, and about that overlap and centering Jews of color in that struggle. Um, so I, let me just say, welcome Marcella, I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Jonathan, it's great to be here. Thanks for having well, me. Oh, well, look, uh, you know, to get us started, I think it might be that many of our audience is not familiar with Bahá'u Shown. So could I ask you to even share just a little bit off the top about the organization and its history? Sure. Um, Bahá'u Lashon was founded 20 years ago and the goal of Bahá'u Lashon has always been to strengthen Jewish identity by raising awareness about the ethnic, racial and cultural diversity of Jewish identity and experience. And we say that a lot and we emphasize that because it's necessary. You know, Jews are multicultural people who've lived around the world for millennia, you know, on every habitable continent, everywhere we are, we look like our neighbors, and we believe that that's an integral part of what it means to be Jewish. Um, through, I first came to Bahá'u Shon, you know, 10 years ago when I signed my daughter up for Camp Bahá'u Shon. And, you know, in addition to training and advocacy and events, you know, the heart of Bahá'u Shon is, is a little camp called Camp Bahá'u Shon. And, and it's the only overnight Jewish camp for young multiracial and multi-ethnic Jews. And we teach them a curriculum called Passport to Peoplehood. And Passport to Peoplehood takes kids around the world and teaches them the history of Jews, of diverse Jews. And that fact that we've lived all around the world and it, it strengthens their notion of Jewish identity. You know, it, it lets them know that they are not the only. Many places that they are, they are the only Jew of color, period. And by, by doing that, we normalize the fact that Jews are a diverse people. You know, they take a lot of strength from that. It, they derive leadership from that. And that really in a nutshell is, is what Bahá'u Shon is all about. It's about making concrete that idea of Jewish diversity. Well, I love that idea of making concrete and endowing these children with a sense of, you know, their place in the world. Talk about, I'd love to hear from you, like why you think it's important, even broad, more broadly, for not just the Jewish community, but others to understand 
the cultural and race, racial and ethnic identity of the Jewish people? You know, I, I think it's because it, it brings us out of this sort of false dichotomy. You know, the idea that there are Jews and there are people of color, you know. Mm -hmm. Jews uh, contain multitudes, we contain Jews of color, we contain multiracial and multi-ethnic Jews, mm -hmm. you know. And once we begin to acknowledge that, it makes it easy for us to engage with ideas of racism and inequality in the United States at large. You know, we begin to understand that these are not external issues that we need to reach you know, outside the community or across the aisle to engage with, but they are Jewish issues. And when we say that, it means that we can look at them through a Jewish lens and lean on Jewish values to help us to approach these issues. You know, we reflect the diversity of America, you know, because we are a multiracial and multi-ethnic people at large. Jews are not a monolith. I love that. And I entirely agree with that. And it's interesting, you know, we were talking a couple of days ago about your own transition of leadership. So maybe you could share a little bit, like, it's not a small thing to take over an organization from its founder, which is kind of what you've done. I mean, can you share a little bit about what this leadership transition means I think for Bahá'u'lláh Hashem as an organization, but also even for you as a leader, I would love to, to probe that a little bit. Yeah, when I, when I think about the reason why I come back to Camp Bahá'u'lláh Hashem a lot, besides the fact that it's so meaningful to my family, is that mm -hmm. we've really seen over the years um, that first cohort of young Jews of color who became strengthened by being around other young Jews of color and creating community, began to take leadership and take ownership of, you know, Bahá'u'lláh Hashem's youth programs. Most recently we had a virtual camp, virtual book camp Bahá'u'lláh Hashem, and they developed, helped develop the curriculum. They mentored wow. younger Jews of color and it was phenomenal. It was nothing we would have ever expected, you know, but they used their own experience to drive what camp could be. And it became something completely unique. And I, I just believe stepping into leadership is part of that continuum. You know, for 20 years, Bahá'u'lláh Hashem has advocated for Jews of color, amplified the voices of Jews of color. Okay, now what does it look like when Jews of color are in positions of power? It's something that we're advocating for and that Jews of color within the Jewish community have been advocating for for decades, you know? Yeah. Positions of power for Jews of color, um, Jews of color on boards, Jews of color, you know, in leadership. And so it, it makes perfect sense that we would be doing this at this time to have a Jew of color leading a multiracial Jewish organization. And in some ways, I, I feel that everything I do helps to try to answer the question of what does it look like when Jews of, of color are in, in power or in positions of power, um, much like the kids did with the camp. You know, I believe that my unique experience as a Jew of color can help to inform what we do next as an organization. And it's, it really feels like a privilege to have the opportunity to do that. Super awesome, super cool. Well, so that leads me to think like, as a Jew of color, like as a black woman, right? As uh, an American, in this moment where we've got so many, like the dynamics in America right now are so intense with so many clashing coming off of January 6th, coming off of the effort to disenfranchise, you know, millions of people in the November elections, coming off of last summer, coming off of COVID. Like, I'd be curious to hear, like, what's on your mind as a moment, as a, le as a leader in this moment, what's on your mind in terms of these different forces and the intersection between communities of color and the Jewish community and how that comes together? Like, do you have a set of priorities or how do you think about that in this moment right now? Well, you know, one thing that's happened to us as an organization, you know, we, we began as a grassroots organization, a tiny local organization. And over the past years, we've become a national and international organization. And more so in the past year than at any other time, just mm -hmm. with all of the unrest, with all of these changes, with all of these upheavals. And we really see our role as keeping the Jewish community's conversation centered on issues of Jewish diversity, on issues of, of racism. You know, we were concerned that after, after last summer, the conversation would change, people would forget, but that actually hasn't been what has happened. If there's one thing that happened, you know, on January 6th, it was that racism and anti-Semitism 
there, there was no way to deny that. There was no way to deny what was happening. And that conversation is not going away. And we believe our role is to continue to push the Jewish community to, to keep talking about these issues, to keep working on internal and external change around these issues. It, it, we feel, I mean, personally, I feel fired up all the time about these issues. Yeah, yeah I'll bet. Well, so that's interesting, right? Because January 6th, you know, we know at ADL that studies extremism, that anti-Semitism and racism are intertwined like a rope running through white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, it's just extraordinary how deeply held these two forms of hate are like in the nucleus of the whole movement of white nationalism. And on January 6th, it was the sort of explicit, like in your face, there was no implicit bias, right? It was explicit, hey, Confederate flags and Camp Auschwitz t-shirts, right? But flip it around. And I think one of the things we're struggling with as a country is the issue of institutional racism, right? Where maybe it is less obvious and it's been systematized to a degree that people are, don't even seem to be paying attention to it, you know? But so as a, as, a, as a black woman who likely encounters these issues, as a Jewish person who is aware, I wonder what you would think in terms of institutional racism that white Jews or other parts of the Jewish community need to be aware of and thinking about like, what, what can white Jews do to deal with those issues when they're not so explicit, but they are more implicit and kind of built into our systems and our institutions? How do we dismantle those? Well, I think, I think we can step back a little back, bit and acknowledge for white Jews that it is possible because of white privilege to benefit from white privilege and at the same time suffer from anti-Semitism because frequently mm -hmm. before we address these issues of institutional racism, mm -hmm. we have to address the issue that racism and anti-Semitism come from the same place and are not, there's no competition there. You know, we, we can right. have both, they're both structural. They both come from the same place, you know, but it, it does begin with recognizing privilege because when you recognize privilege and recognize that it's not personal, you know, that white privilege doesn't mean that you have some kind of great power beyond, you know, that you're not being conferred something. It's yeah. in some ways white privilege is about what doesn't happen to you, you know, and what you don't have and barriers that don't exist for you. Um, it, it requires doing personal identity work to, mm -hmm. you know, begin by acknowledging whiteness. You know, mm -hmm. something that I, frequ I frequently get asked um, you know, by parents, how do I start talking to my kids about race? You know, mm -hmm. how do I begin to help my kids confront these issues? And one of the first things that I usually ask them is, okay, tell me how old your children were the first time you told them they were white. Uh -huh. you know? And most people don't have an answer for that. Just starting from acknowledging whiteness as a concept. They, I mean, these are very fundamental things we need to do on our path to confronting structural racism is understanding, you know, our own participation in it, often inadvertent, and beginning to confront that as a way to make greater change. Mm. Good stuff. I mean, it's interesting. I think, I think there are many white Jews who indeed have, have struggled with, well, how can I be, how can I be discriminated when I'm Jewish, and I'm a victim? And I think you're, the way we present often defines the way people see us, right? Which doesn't mean you can't have, be experiencing anti-Semitism but benefit from white privilege. I think it's a really important point, Marcel. So thank you for thank you for making it. So, you know, I, I think you know I would ask like the Jewish communal world. You've got some big institutions like an ADL or federations or others, and then you have you know some really important newer organizations that are smaller and they're maybe less old, like the whole shown is relatively speaking smaller or the field building initiative and some others. How can Jewish communal institutions engage, would you think in a more constructive way around the issues facing Jews of color? What would be like your recommendation for whether it's an ADL or a federation or an APAC or whomever? What, what do you think they need to do to be, to center Jews of color more in the work? I, I think first of all, they need to be willing to collaborate with smaller organizations and to frequently allow them to take the lead. To say, you know, if you if we have these questions and we wanna handle these questions, let's reach mm -hmm. out to these smaller organizations and be willing to partner while allowing them to take the lead and being willing to learn 
from smaller organizations and the organizations that are doing this work and on the ground doing this work. And from there, um, using your greater footprint to amplify these messages and amplify what they are doing and amplify their work and support their work. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes we think that what we need to do is start afresh, you know, okay, how do we build a program around, you know, Jews of color and, you know, empowering Jews of color. Sometimes it's as simple as reach out to an organization that's already doing this work and mm -hmm. amplify their efforts. I think that's a very fair point. Do you think sometimes that whether intentionally or not that white Jews end up erasing Jews of color in their efforts? That can happen when white Jews begin to think of racism as something that needs to be done for Jews of color, for black mm -hmm. Jews, to help mm -hmm. black Jews, instead of seeing this as a fight that we are all engaged in mm -hmm. and, and taking racism personally. And, mm -hmm. and again, saying that it's a Jewish issue. So all Jews are you know, compelled to do this work. When, mm -hmm. when we think of racism as a problem that's for black Jews, that's how we begin to erase them because we, you right. know, we undermine our, our, it's undermining our power. Right. It's saying that we need to wait to get some help instead of saying, oh, I need to help you to, for us to work together. It, it disempowers, you know, us. Yeah, how do you square the fact that for some like Jews in America, this is so hard to grapple with or has not been something front of mind when I think many Jews and the overwhelming majority of American Jews identify as Zionists hold such great, take such great pride in, you know, the Operation Solomon and the Ethiopian Jews and take such pride in the perceptibly diverse multiracial society, Jewish society in Israel. Why don't they see it here? Like, what do you attribute that kind of disconnect to? Um, I, I, I think it's engaging with, again, institutionalized, institutional racism, mm -hmm. um, engaging with the history of racism in the United States. Again, we have that binary of, of black and white it's complicated by Jews' very complicated relationship to whiteness in the mm -hmm. United States. You know, until mm -hmm. post World War II, in most cases, Jews were not seen as white, mm -hmm. and you know, anti-Semitism was very public and very obvious. You know, quotas with universities, um, certain professions, and so when we see that shift after World War II into whiteness, that's when we begin to take on issues of racism in the United States and we begin to, you know, be complicate the relationship between, you know, white people and black people and white Jews and black Jews. It's just not the same history in other countries. Yeah. And maybe that's it. I do think you're right that there was a change after the Second World War, which in some ways created, you know, it was empowering for Jews. In some ways they were able to assimilate much more effectively. On the other hand, you know, I think it confused the community in different ways too. There's a legacy there. Mm -hmm. So let me also just ask you, I think we got a lot, I'm seeing a bunch of questions in the chat, but I wanna ask you one other question and maybe it's a little personal, so I'll say it up front. But like, you know, over this past year, we've seen so like the last 12 months, nine, 12 months, you know, we had these very high profile, the murder of Ahmed Aubrey, who's sort of the lynch, I would describe that as actually and the murder of George Floyd in broad daylight by a police officer and the killing of Breonna Taylor, these very high profile, horrible and indisputably unambiguously unjust murders, which by the way, you know, there have been a series. It's not new, the unjust murders of unarmed, you know, African-American civilians. Let's just acknowledge that. But that, that being said, that kind of catalyzes this movement of racial justice that's playing out now. And at the same time, and it's got a long way to go, well, it's long overdue, but at the same time, you have this parallel track of this like rampant anti-Semitism from Pittsburgh to all the incidences in 2019. You had the highest number of incidents ADL's ever tracked to, you know, the, 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 just the demonization of kind of in the public conversation of Jews in, in places. Like as, as, a, as a Jewish woman of color, like how do you, like what has this meant like for you to have both these aspects of these identities that you carry with you and about who you are being in such conflict, like how do you, how do you deal with it? Uh, for me, um, I'm, a, I'm a black Jew, I'm a Jew of color. Um, I, I don't see a conflict there because my you know, intersectionality, my identity is complicated. Yeah. I am both black and I am Jewish. So anti-Semitism and racism both attack me 
Yes. In the same way. I see both of them as threats. You know, that goes for my family as well. I mean, over the past year, um, my, my son, my almost 16 year old son is black. He's black and he's Jewish. And when the Capitol was swarmed on January 6th, I hadn't seen him cry since he was a child. And he said, you know, they're attacking everything about me. They're attacking my entire identity. And, you know, I haven't recovered from that as a parent, you know, hearing him say those things. So the past year, I, I haven't seen a conflict between what it means to be black and what it means to be Jewish. I've actually felt under attack for both of those identities over the past year. And, you know, in some ways it was, it was that feeling that, you know, led me to work towards leadership within Bohol was feeling that that unique identity was really needed at this time because yeah, we're, we're, we're under attack. We, we feel marginalized on multiple, <laughs> on multiple levels. And we really need to continue to talk about that and, you know, Jews of color really need to come out and talk about racism and anti-Semitism because we, we suffer both of those things. That's what I mean. It's just so heavy. It's so hard. I mean, I think we all bear a burden, but I can imagine it's even more amplified in many ways. Like for your story about your son, it's heartbreaking, Marcella. I mean, it's really heartbreaking. So I wish I could transition to a more positive note, but I just gotta, I mean, maybe there is like, do you do, I don't know, like maybe you could share some of your own family traditions or something that's a little bit more positive or uplifting before you move to the questions. You know, like I have a multiracial Jewish home and I can tell you, we have excellent kosher Iranian food in our house, which is always fun. <laughs> so I don't know if you've got any interesting traditions that you might even share before we go to the questions, but I'd love to do something that's a little bit more, you know, positive before we move, move on. Well, you know, one thing I'm often asked actually, when I'm, when I'm asked about tensions between black communities and Jewish communities is how that plays out in my own life. Because my family, my black family is not Jewish. And so the question oh, becomes- that's interesting. That's you, interesting. You have, you know, anti-Semitism within your family, you know, how do they feel about your family? And what we've seen, what I've seen across the board throughout my lifetime has been overwhelming, positive, acceptance and embrace of Jewish traditions. We're at a point now in our family where Passover is infinitely bigger than Thanksgiving. You know, oh, really? That's me. All of our family coming together to, you know, around the Haggadah, we just lost my grandfather and he was such a powerful presence at the Seder table, even though uh -huh. he was not, you know, a Jewish patriarch Him <laughs> being a patriarch there, you know, added weight to it. And that's definitely been the experience of my of my entire family, my entire Jewish journey, you know, the I, I'll always remember, you know, at my daughter's uh, bat mitzvah, seeing this this row of of um, black church going uncles, and they don't have kippot, but they have these hats, you know, <laughs> church hats, because they know that they they want to, you know, be respectful within the synagogue, and that's how they did it. That's been my experience in my family, and so when people ask me if there are any conflicts, there no. Um, the opposite, I think, is true. I think it helps to enrich my Judaism and my kids' Judaism, seeing the rest of their family support them. I think that's super awesome. That's super awesome. All right, that's great. Like, I can keep talking to you, but I want to be respectful because we've got, I see 46 comments in the chat. So a lot of people with questions and thoughts. And Allison, you're so great. Maybe you can, I don't know, help us, help, help us with these. Yeah, thanks so much, Marcella. Um, yeah, the chat is just on fire. There's a lot. So let's see if we can um, get to some of these questions. So to start off, Marcella, you answered this question in the context of major organizations, but what three concrete steps would you suggest for local communities, synagogues, JCCs to take to better support Jews of color? First of all, I would say on an individual level, again, it's working on identity and on how racism affects everyone. And this, and it is concrete, you know, it's possible to do the reading, it's possible to do the work, to really begin to grapple with the issues that are at hand and, and understand everyone's complicity in, in what is going on. Um, I would say communities working on belonging, 
within Jewish communities. And what I mean by that is that the first step often that many communities take when they're saying, you know, how can we work on racism in the Jewish community? It's like, oh, we need to be more welcoming. You know, we need to have greeters who understand that Jews, you know, come in all hues and welcome everyone. And that is great. However, um, Jews of color are already within the Jewish community and they don't need to be welcomed. They need to feel that they belong. And so taking steps to work on that, what does belonging look like in your Jewish community? And I would say preparing the way for Jewish diversity in your smaller organizations, in your communities. And that can mean, that can mean training, for example, working on organizational change, because we want diversity. We want to encourage diversity. But it's not so simple as finding Jews of color to be in your community or in leadership, but preparing your entire community to be welcoming to them and to be make them feel that they belong when they get there. That's great, thanks so much. Um, Jonathan, many folks in the chat have noted the uptick in hate crimes against Asian Americans. How is ADL currently partnering to fight against this hate and how can the greater Jewish communities address this crisis? That's a great question. I think one of the things that we try to do at ADL, like our mission compels us to fight anti-Semitism in all forms of hate. Some forms of intolerance or bigotry we may know better, like anti-Jewish bigotry. And, in, and we can maybe lead on that. And in other places, I think we need to support and stand in solidarity with our allies. I got to tell you, you know, this rash of anti-Asian or anti-AAPI hate has been horrifying. You know, it's always been there, but after, to be perfectly frank, again, I don't want to get political on this phone call. We are a nonpartisan organization. But after President Trump started going after and blaming the COVID-19, uh, you know, novel coronavirus on China and on a, calling it the Wuhan flu and the China, some of the horrible things, we watched a spike in anti-Asian hate, acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence. And in the last few weeks, and Marcella knows that she's in the Bay Area, there's been a series of high profile, brutal assaults of elderly Asian American people, which is particularly disgusting. I think there's few things that are more cowardly than sucker punching an old person from behind. It's beyond me. We've made a series of statements about this. We've been working with local law enforcement on this, particularly in the Bay Area. And uh, we have also been engaging with Asian American or API organizations who are tracking these incidences, sharing our information about tracking hate crimes, and trying to give them suggestions and strategies and other ways to respond. So I think it's standing up publicly, it's working with the authorities, and it's partnering with and supporting AIPI organizations who are trying to deal with this problem right now. So we have a lot of questions that have come up in the chat around finding a political safe space for Jews of color right now. What would that space look like if we could create it? Um, Marcella, why don't we start with you and then Jonathan, you can add the pieces that ADL can contribute here. So a uh, political safe space. I wonder if it's possible to expand upon that. Do we mean a safe space in politics at large, supporting Jews of color in, in politics? Yeah, I think that's what we mean. Hmm, that's, that's interesting. Um, I, I think across the board, um, people of color, and maybe maybe I can partly speak from my personal experience, uh, prefer self determination, you know, over over support. So a political self space, uh, safe space might look like simply more Jews of color in in politics. That at large, like I don't think that is a political position if that makes sense. Like that doesn't require, that doesn't ask you to be conservative or liberal to simply say more, more of them, more in politics, um, you know, improving the pipeline that gets them there, you know, and it's not like that's not the case in other contexts, you know, either. It's, it's, it's about the pipeline. It's about supporting them once they get there. And it's about more numbers. Yeah, I mean, look, I think we've got a center Jews of color in the experience. You know, it's not for me to say how we do that. I think we need to listen to people who are, you know, in this, you know, as part of our multiracial community and what their needs are. I think that's critical. I think recognizing that, as, as Marcel said before, like Jewish people, some of us benefit from white privilege, even as, you know, we suffer from anti-Semitism, it doesn't exempt us from racism, even unintentional. 
And at the same time, those of us who are at the intersection of these different worlds, whether you are Asian American, or you are Latino, or you are African American, or you are, you know, Sephardi Mizrahi, again, you don't present as white, uh, you face a different and more complicated set of circumstances. And making sure that our policies and making sure that our politics are mindful of that, that acknowledge that, I think is a very helpful thing. Great. Uh, Jonathan, there are a lot of questions around cancel culture. Um, do you have a theory as to why it seems that cancel culture applies much more to perceived racist remarks than to perceived anti-Semitic attacks or remarks? Well, I guess I have a few thoughts on that. Like, look, I think people who espouse racism or anti-Semitism, you know, uh, I don't think racism and anti-Semitism should have a place in the public conversation. It's not cancel culture that people who engage in that in those kinds of divisive tactics, who demean people based on how they look or how they pray or where they're from, it isn't cancel culture. Say, I don't want to hear from that guy. I don't think that is cancel culture per se. I think that it is, we should have a zero tolerance policy on intolerance. Now, as a Jewish person, I also believe in tshuva. I believe that people can with authenticity and with intent, uh, you know, make amends and do better. So I think we should give people the benefit of the doubt and give them an opportunity. But uh, for those who don't want that, who don't think there's, there's anything wrong, again, with denigrating people, again, based on some immutable characteristic. I don't think it's cancel culture to say, I don't wanna hear from that person. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, Allison, but um, uh, I think I think it's complicated. I, again, I believe in Chuba, I give people a chance, but I also just don't think we have to have a, we have to tolerate intolerance. I, I don't buy that. Yeah. Marcella, did you have anything you wanted to add here? Um, I, I, I think I would I would co-sign that. I, I think that we can we can be down on racism and down on anti-Semitism and call people to account when they engage in those activities and say things that reinforce those ideas. Um, at the same time, I do agree that Teshuva is part of this as well. We also need to help teach people how to apologize in many ways and engage in that. I mean, that, that's one of the things when we begin a training that we that we do is we prepare to teach people how to make mistakes. Often people don't wanna talk about race because they're afraid they're going to make mistakes. When in fact, that's part of the process. That's part of the learning process. But this is something, it's such a great point. Like I feel like the ability to apologize has almost been lost. Yeah. Like humility seems to be in short supply. Maybe that's post-Trump America, I don't know. But I, like, we're all imperfect and acknowledging that. I think you wanna cure cancel culture, try humility. I think that would go a long way and we all need to have it because you know all of us are on a bit of a journey and none of us, I think, have it all figured out. So I, I, I agree, teaching people to, again, recognize your own, an authentic way, recognize your error and repent. Why is that so hard? Feels like a very opportune time to jump on that too during a pandemic when everybody's yeah, kind of home right. doing the self-reflection. Um, it's a great question that's kind of like back to the basics a little bit. And Marcel, we'll start with you on this one. How do you define Jew of color? Is it just a personal choice of how to identify or is there a broader definition? Um, I think my first answer would say um, yes. That it's, it's possible, you know, it's one of, ultimately, it is up to each individual person to decide how they identify, right? When, when I say Jew of color myself, I, I identify myself as one. And I always want to emphasize the fact that Jew of color does not mean black and Jewish. It's Jew of color. We have, you know, um, Latino Jews of color. We have Asian American Jews of color. We have Native American Jews of color, and they each come to the to the term in their own way and identify themselves if they choose to do so in their own ways. It's it's one of those those things where, you know, how do people want to be identified? This is about learning how to make mistakes. Ask. You know, it each each person is different. It it's as it's as simple as that. Um, I, just so you know. 
I use my Jewish space lasers to identify the Jews of color. <laughs> my, my space lasers as well. <laughs> that, that comes in a, in a later training that we know. You know, you're speaking to the Georgian here. Um, no, that's true. Yeah. Uh, many people are asking questions about Louis Farrakhan. Um, and I'd love to hear both of your thoughts about what we can do to combat his hateful rhetoric. And Marcella, why don't we start with you and then kick it over to Jonathan. I, um, I think I'd like to say, first of all, that we, we, do, we do enter um, a complicated space for Jews of color and particularly black Jews in this regard, because we are frequently called upon to disavow Farrakhan. Like, why haven't you disavowed Farrakhan? Why haven't you come out against Farrakhan? As if we have a special line to Farrakhan or, you know, we can send him, you know, send the group text to explain how we feel and make sure he understands where we stand on anti-Semitism. You know, and I, and I say that as, you know, obviously a, as a joke, but really the same tools that we use to combat anti-Semitism, it's not a special case. You know, he's one person who spouts anti-Semitic theories and statements. And there's nothing special about that. Anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism. You know, there's no such thing as black anti-Semitism. You know, anti-Semitism has no color. It's hateful, no matter who it's coming from. And we use the same tools to address it with, with this person as we would with anyone else. Yeah, look, like Louis Farrakhan is one of the most public, arguably the most public kind of anti-Semite in the country. But I think like having to suggest that all black people need to disavow anti-Semite Louis Farrakhan is as wrong as asking like me as a Jewish person, do I have to disavow uh, Jeffrey Epstein or do I have to disavow some Jewish, well-known Jewish racists like Mayor Kahani before I have a conversation. Like, yeah, I think we should hold him to account like we hold any other anti-Semite, any other racist, any other hateful person to account for sure. I don't give him an excuse or a, or a pass. Um, but at the same time, like, why does Marcella have to disavow him before we can be in dialogue with her? Do I have to disavow again every hateful Jewish person before I can be in dialogue with someone else? It doesn't typically, that isn't typically asked of me. And I generally believe in the principle of do unto others. So again, it's not to excuse the stuff that this guy says, but he is marginal. And, and individuals among us are not, like individuals like Marcella or me are not responsible for the most hateful people, the worst elements of our community. Yeah, great. Um, we just got another really great question, which is, so how can white Jews talk about their efforts to be allies in the fight for racial justice without erasing the identity of black Jews in the process? Mm. And Marcella, why don't we start with you and then Jonathan, you can talk a little bit about what we're doing at ADL. Um, I, 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 think this, I think this is a challenge for many people. You know, how, do you, how do you do both? Um, again, it's, it's as simple as often listening as being prepared to not take the lead. People want to help. You know, people get excited about helping. People say, you know, how can I help? You know, what about me? Uh, it, it is about taking a step back and taking a look at, you know, am I helping? Have I talked to someone and asked them what they need from me? You know, I remember um, a few years ago, there was um, the, the idea to, for allies to wear um, a safety pin to let people know that they were allies mm. and oh, that there right. was an ally out there to, to help them on the bus or on the street. And the, the pushback was, that's not, that's not what we need. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That probably feels great, but it's actually not helping. And I, it's, about, it's about, I think, a lot of asking and not, not taking center stage because often that's the way to help is to be quiet. Mm. And that's tough. People want to do something but sometimes the way to help is to not take the floor. I totally agree with that. I think standing down and listening for a change, not, you know, you know that term mansplain, you know? Like, I don't think we need to Jew-splain, so to speak, to other Jewish people how to show up. And in fact, if we stopped and paused and listened, we might do better. But Allison, you know, you asked me the question how ADL is doing it, you know, I'm, I may be the CEO, 
but I'm only as good as my staff and my people. Mm -hmm. So I'd like, might like to, if I might, this is sort of unconventional, but can I turn it around to you? Like, how do you, how are you doing it running the ADL Southern Division? It, whether it's in our Atlanta office or Florida office or New Orleans office, St. Louis, tell us how you do it. Yeah, um, I don't mind at all. And I really appreciate Marcella's response here because I think maybe that's what we've been trying to do without being as intentional with those words as she put it, which is we integrate a lot of uh, Jews of color and black Jews specifically onto our boards, into our programming, into our um, community work and our coalition work. Um, we love Bechol Lashon here in Atlanta and um, reach out to them pretty frequently. Um, for those of you that have Bechol Lashon in your communities, it's an amazing resource and I highly encourage y'all to connect. Um, we also have been kind of engaging with synagogues and federations and JCCs and other community centers on leading these conversations of what is, what is having an inclusive community in your synagogue that you want mean? Um, and we've run into a very interesting tension, I'll say, um, especially maybe a year or so ago when there was such a, a, a slew of high profile kind of mass attacks against houses of worship and synagogues. Mm -hmm. We're really concerned about security and some of them had, you know, full time professional security staff and sometimes some of them it was all lay leader run, but there was a lot of concern of kind of how to be, um, you know, inclusive radically inclusive is the term they were using in Atlanta while also like thinking about security. And so we've been like really urging a, a, a real reflection of our community here in Atlanta to understand who we are, right? And not kind of operate on the assumption um, that everybody looks like me. Bravo. Uh, so um, let's see, I think we're gonna close out Q&A with one last question. So before we end, we've talked a lot about complex and tough topics, but before we say goodbye, uh, tell us a few things you see in the world that make you hopeful for the future. I think hearing Marcella's story about um, Passover and you know the head coverings is really uplifting. I'd love to hear more about kind of what keeps you going and hopeful in the future. As any parent will almost certainly tell you, it, it is my kids. Um, they are 15 and 21 and they are the future of Judaism. I've been so proud of them over the past year, how honest they have been with me about their experiences. And in particular with my daughter, how much I have learned from her in the past year. Um, the younger generations are so profoundly aware of issues in our, in our society and they are so intolerant of intolerance and of inequality. And that, that gives me tremendous hope that I hope to pass along to them a better world than we have now. But I also trust that they are going to do amazing things with the world that they inherit. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I, I, I could say plus one to that. Um, although we have different kids, I think my kids would also make me incredibly helpful. And I think my kids, um, have a degree of openness and tolerance that I don't think was prevalent in my generation. And so the level of, again, openness is really the word and acceptance among the younger generation, I think is truly, that gives me hope. It gives me hope that um, while it's true that there was a lot of intolerance in the last four years coming in from the highest levels of authority, it also gives me hope that there were people speaking out against that. I mean, we have seen this sort of renaissance of civic participation like never before. You know, people coming together across lines of difference to register people to vote, to protest, you know, police brutality, to show up and um, make a difference through so many different means. I think that's incredibly inspiring. And I also think, you know, as a Jewish person, I'm like deeply humbled by this community that I try to serve as the head of the ADL. I don't know if there's ever been a more adaptive, inventive, resilient people. Our ability to survive through different difficult circumstances across geographies and cultures is amazing. 
And so I think the richness and uniqueness of American Jewish life is exemplified, you know, by the Jews of color here among us and so much else is you know, also, I think, a source, of, a source of hope. I mean, we live in a multiracial world. Our Jewish community is deeply multiracial, as Marcella reflected in the beginning of the conversation. And that seeing that dynamism and the things that come from that, by the way, like I'm, I think about Young Gravy. Do you know Young Gravy, Marcella? I'm sure he's involved in the Coalition programming. Do you know this guy? Oh, he's this very cool uh, African-American, like he identifies as biracial young Jewish man from San Diego who uh, has an amazing gift for hip hop. He's a talented rapper and his stuff is great. And like when I see that kind of rich, that kind of creativity in the Jewish community, it's, I find that, you know, incredibly inspiring. Yeah, creativity. And I, just to expand upon that, as you're saying, um, the resilience of the Jewish people, you know, we, we do believe that diversity is our greatest strength. You know, if you look at Jews in the United States and, and the Jewish um, culture in the United States alone. We've gone from Sephardic Jews arriving in the you know, 17th century to German Jews arriving in the early 19th century to right. Jews arriving out of Eastern Europe and then to um, you know, all kinds of um, immigration and all kinds of diversity. Um, and we just keep growing as a people and we keep changing as a people. And we do respond to change really well because you know we we survive. You know, it's something I always say to my kids is that you come from two different people who survive, who survive so much, and that will continue to do that. Will continue to survive and thrive. Here, here. Wow, this has been really inspiring and what a great way to conclude. I mean, the power of resiliency, the power and kind of opportunity in building on our diversity, the, the power of our civic engagement and people really digging in. I mean, I think we are really living in a moment um, where change feels within arm's reach. So thank you all both so much for sharing such valuable insights. And of course, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Our Fighting Hate From Home series will continue next month. So keep an eye on your inbox for registration information. Until then, stay safe and continue to be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.